Mana i ngā reo rauranga tira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Fraser Smith, tako ingoa. My mother was a preschool educator. She was a preschool advisor, actually. And my father, after being a principal, became the director of Māori and Island Education. That was back in the days of Norman Kirk, and he was instrumental in bringing about Kohanga Reo in his day, which is very interesting. Um, my great grandparents were paramount chiefs of Ngati Hau, Whakapara is Te Marae. With parents like that, I really didn't need to go to teachers' college because conversations at home had me pretty well versed in educational theory. And as we saw earlier this morning, it hasn't really changed very much since the 1950s. So that's cool. Otoru is 98% Māori, as I say, Deso 1A. Our kids bus in from Kaitaia. What we found when, when I first got there was, was that we needed to connect kids to meaningful experiences. And we did lots of field trips, but uh, those field trips were getting expensive, so we developed the grounds as an environment for learning. And we started by planting a mandarin tree for every kid. And we planted 60, because we, when we had 60 kids, and that worked. The field trips were a big, were a big part of our time um, when we were trying to get our kids actually into right into this cooperative learning stuff. Um, we planted more trees. We got beehives, chooks, olive trees, gardens, hothouses, worm farms, composting stations. And then the kids requested a registered kitchen so we could sell the products that we made. We grew medicinal plants and we started to use them to cure our ailments. I had kids taking propolis out of our beehives and I got a still and put it in the schoolhouse for medicinal purposes only and and we used it to 90% um, alcohol dissolves propolis which comes from beehives which k kills bad infections like school sores and any pussy infections it's marvelous kills kutus and then we thought oh we can make kutu kakite so we grew catnip and that worked then we thought oh what hit, hits us on campus mosquitoes so we made the stuff we called tipi haere namu namu, which is sort of like go away mosquito. And um, catnip worked for that and we made oh, stuff for scabies and we used olives and olive oil. So we started, we started picking olives and um, it grew and we formed partnerships and we ended up picking large amounts of olives like a tonne a day. And then we ended up with all this oil and we had to find other ways to use it and we started inventing soap and all sorts of stuff. So that's sort of part of how everything sort of grew from there. Um, when the NZC came along, in a way, we were already doing it. Um, and in, in the first year of NZC, ERO came along and they said to me, well, how long have you been doing the New Zealand curriculum? And I said, oh, I think maybe five years, because we sort of had, you know. And then national standards were introduced. I just carried on. I asked Hekia Parata, because um, she said, oh, we're, um, she wrote it in the, in, in the school budget report. Take all to do school, learning and earning and having fun. So when I got a chance to get, get in her ear, I said to her, well, um, can, does that mean we can carry on doing this stuff? And she said, oh, you should do more. And I said, oh, okay. So I'm just going to use national standards as a check uh, twice a year? She said, yep, that'll do. So I thought, oh, we've got a permission now. So I carried on. At about that stage, we, we had um, community problem solvers go over to the States and our community problem solvers got second in the world, so we sent them again. <laughs> the second time we couldn't get much money, so we had to make heaps of olive oil and products to sell. We got, had to get 30 grand worth of products, all made in our registered kitchen, so that was cool. Um, at the moment, as we are now, Otoru School has 
high level of transience. So the role dropped from 52, but then we got a good name and it started to grow and in three years we had three times that number. And then it became really difficult to be these entrepreneurs and have kids out in gardens and in the kitchen and doing stuff because all the classrooms were full, the library was full, the kitchen had a classroom in it and we'd run out of space. And then along came the Ministry of Education and said, your school's getting too big, you're going to have to have an enrolment zone, and so we did that. And then we'll give you a new, um, a new school. So I thought, oh yeah, cool, we'll have the new school. But the roll dropped after the zone came in, the roll just went boof again, and we lost 40 kids. And when we lost 40 kids, all of a sudden, there's $100,000 out of the budget for this year that I've got to find somehow. So I have to get, go picking more olive oil, I guess. But our community problem solvers, actually, we wanted to empower our kids. So we wanted them to design their curriculum, to be in charge of their learning. And they got in with the architects on the rebuild and they helped the architects with the redesign. It's five years down the track now and they've started building, which is great. We're still getting prefabs, but the prefabs are with the kids' ideas in them. So we get to keep a registered kitchen. We get a whare nui and a dining hall and things like that. So all of that's pretty cool. This is on, on the side here when um, the first lot of kids, I had tadpoles like 2,000 and they were hatching out and the kids started squeezing them to see the squiggly bits that came out. And my measure of um, improvement was that they stopped squeezing the tadpoles and they actually got to metamorphosize and the kids watched them metamorphosize and the kids discovered things like if you feed tadpoles pollen they metamorphosize twice as fast. So that's what we started doing, <laughs> buying pollen from the women health shop and then we found it in the beehives, yeah. Um, in the future because we haven't really changed much, except the teachers have come and gone, and new teachers, all the new teachers, which is all of them, um, have to be retaught in Oturutanga. And the idea of life without national standards is quite foreign to them. So there's a wee challenge for me. Okay, so the f for the future, we need to hold on to Oturutanga, and that's a challenge. Challenge. We've got vision, mission, mission, values. We've got our community, our teachers, and our students, and they've all spent two years working on aligning values and then building a graduate student profile, and that's aligned with the New Zealand curriculum, and this is also aligned with the key competencies, so we don't have to double up. And then we've uh, created an, an ideal teacher profile and we use a student graduate profile for students to write written reports on their own achievement and our ideal teacher profile is used with teachers' inquiry as a basis for teachers' appraisal. So, yeah, we're there, except the teachers keep changing. Um, where we are now, we've got four modules of eight new buildings arriving in a month. And we'll be fenced into a tiny space. We have a strong belief in student agency and contextualised learning. I take the year eights out sailing every year. That kid there, he turns out he's a natural tiller man. Uh, it's interesting what the sea turns up for us sometimes. Um, we use our gardens well, but we need to build on this. All, all our gardens and 100 plus fruit trees and medicinal native plants will have to be replaced next year. Our rebuild will have a registered kitchen and a dining teaching area and a whare nui. Kids insisted on this. We can have our library back, um, which, and we can have a maker space area, a bigger one. Um, hey, Fano have given us land, so we have shifted the fences because it's Māori land around us. So, oh, I'll just go out that way a bit, and so I spent quite a bit of, bit of money on fencing last year. <laughs> we got a couple of extra hectares. <laughs> I told the ministry it was for um, boundaries.
um, the kids will be able to totally redesign our landscape. We'll be working in multi-classroom blocks of three joined classrooms and they won't leak. Again, the challenge is to hold on to what we've already got. Over the last nine or so years, the influence of the standards on teaching has been huge. None of our teachers really know about life without the standards and we have to build confidence and knowledge in how to use integrated and contextualised learning. I um, imported a partner from Kristen. She was leader of dance and drama at Kristen. So I got her into Aotearoa School one day a week and next minute we got on to the Auckland University Dance Department and through um, Dr. Barb and Professor Buck and all these other people, we're now working on integrating dance and drama and the arts right through the learning, and I'll get into that in a minute. Now we're working on ways to, to show progress instead of assessment. We're working on ways for our written reports to be student-driven and on ways to reduce assessment and give teachers the assurance that we can integrate and encourage deep and meaningful learning as everyday practice, or tūrutanga. So we're big on the environment, that's that third, um, that's that extra learning space. It's easy to produce and it's right there. It's hard to maintain and we have to, I have to teach con teachers continually gardening skills, all the skills that, you know, that they need to develop that curiosity, curiosity and discovering outside. Um, Soap, our latest discovery, was really cool because olive oil makes the meanest soap. So for conferences like this, what people do is they get onto our website and they request Otteru School olive oil, soap, honey and those products and we sell thousands. That's, that's the way to do it, a little marketing ploy there in case you're having another one. For gifts for speakers and all that sort of stuff, yeah that works. That's pretty much the strategic plan right there. I worked with the Springboard Trust and that's pretty much it. The last one, the green one about the Kahuiako, I've been working on the Kaitiaki group for three, maybe three years now and it's a very slow moving beast. We've got 21 schools in the far north. So to get something cohesive with five iwi and 21 schools is not particularly easy but it is really happening, it's just slow. Um, interesting, um, what the iwi want and what the, all the communities want totally lines up with what everyone's talking about here today. So it's, it's not about um, they don't want mathematicians or professors or doctors who are going to come down to Auckland and buy a house. They want people of value to come back and live in their communities. And they want good citizens, uh, in a nutshell. Um, I'll read you a little bit from an article by Dr Barbara Snook. <clears throat> in New Zealand, arts education has not been a focus in teacher education institutes for several decades. As a result, there are many teachers in schools who are not confident to teach in or through the arts. A great deal of support is therefore required to empower New Zealand teachers to teach the arts curriculum effectively as a standalone learning area and also to teach across the cur curriculum through the arts integration. Aotearoa School has one arts teacher who is teaching one 40 minute lesson per week in every classroom to provide the teachers with strategies and ideas that they themselves may implement. As researchers we are supporting the arts teacher so that she might understand the difference between teaching an art form and using arts integration to teach in other subject areas when using arts integration it is important that lessons are not driven from an arts perspective. As the non-arts curriculum content can end up being superficial. So far we have run several professional development days with teachers and these have been extremely valuable in developing teacher understanding and enthusiasm. I'm going to skip some of that. Um, what is happening is really interesting because 
someone once drew, um, drew you know, the, the learning pit, you can draw, draw a graph like that. We've been in the pit, we're coming out the other side and we're climbing up the wall now and we've got that willingness, I've got eight teachers at the moment with a willingness to learn about the arts. They've found it's actually working in many ways. Um, students have become more accepting of each other and are working more cooperatively. Boys who were once reluctant in oral language are becoming engaged and showing exceptional ability in art subjects. Students who were shy and withdrawn have developed confidence. One previously shy student has gone on to become a leader in dance movement based lessons. And another now contributes ideas in class. We're in the early stages of the research, says Barb, but the results so far support current research on the benefits of the arts in nurturing student learning. That's the old soap making right there. Batch number one. Batch number two, they tooted with the scales and I put, um, we, we put too much, not enough caustic soda and it never set. This idea of science and everything is right there and everything has to be just perfect for soap, temperatures, you name it. Um, anyway, the dance and the drama. So I walked into a class to do a day's relieving and they'd been working on the concept of a limerick through dance. Josie took the first lesson and she was working on a hip-hop dance, clapping time, phrasing, rhyme patterning, and these were written for an audience and for participation, danced and sang in pairs. So when I got in, they had an idea, but they couldn't really get the discipline of a limerick, you know, like you've got the first two lines rhyme, the second two lines rhyme, and the last r line rhymes with the first two. But it didn't take long, because I had my guitar, and that sort of helped things along, because you can get a bit of rhythm going, and so one boy came up with one. There was a boy called Jake who wanted to bake a cake. He put in some malt and plenty of salt and found it was a mistake. So, and, but this, gen this is going on because um, it's like you generate it in class. So with me, the kids shared and called out the verses as they wrote. And others added rhymes and limes by calling out their ideas. And this was an engaged and happily very noisy class. But then we sang them all together and everyone's t um, hitchhiking off each other. And I made some, up some tunes on the guitar and then um, they started flying out of the, all over the place. So we got Bob the Slob. I have an uncle named Bob who is an incredible slob. He eats possum stew with all the guts and the goo, stuffing it all down his gob. <laughs> and, 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 like, um, and this one, my favourite one, is like Jack. Well, it was a young man named Jack who was always on the attack. He used a machete to chop up spaghetti until it flew all over his back. Well, they're supposed to be silly, you know, that's one of the cr criteria. <laughs> Kids are surprised and gratified to learn those off by heart very quickly and perform to others for a laugh. So we've got kids teaching kids, and there was a total engagement with both audience and performers. Here we had kids as teachers, and the teacher was having fun. That's a fruit bowl. So what we've got to do next is find joy in the New Zealand curriculum, right? So. Um, I have to get to the point where teachers aren't spending the three weeks before written reports assessing kids. They moan about it, but they can't stop. Um, yeah. um, so, oh, here's another example of stuff. The other day I walked into a lesson on skip counting in fives. Um, it was a year three class. There was a large clock face, it was drawn in chalk in the floor of, on the floor of the class and the furniture was cleared away. The numbers are drawn from 1 to 12 around the clock face and the, all the class members are sitting around the circle. One child jumps around the clock as the rest of the class clap 5, 10, 15, 20 and they take turns doing this. Then they go outside and draw their own clock to jump around. After three lessons, um, each one graduated to a time-like sequence 
And within two weeks, the kids were telling analog time. They could tell quarter two, quarter past, three turns to the left, and all the rest of it, and, and counting in fives. It's just, um, they learnt fractions, backwards, forwards, half turns, quarter turns, left, right, etc. That's Maui. He's just been discovered in the waka. Voila! <laughs> when he um, fished up New Zealand, um, the kids are asked to freeze frame read um, texts and, and show what's happening. That's a wind study day. We're studying the wind and taking it to Tukuro Beach. Kids made kites or sailing boats. Um, we just get on the bus, two buses, off we go. This is dance for the wind. There's a wind dance. They're interpreting aspects of the wind. Um, here, teachers uh, and teacher aides are designing a concept for planting with their gardens all mapped out. There's fractions and all sorts going on. This is um, an interpretation of precipitation, the rain. And there's the storm clouds building. Ha, teaching moments. That wasp lived on the windowsill of a classroom for ages and the kids just watched it. And it was almost like tame. You can see it's got a large drop of water coming out of its mouth. It was outside in the rain and it was putting its mouth inside, <laughs> sucking up the water and spitting it out. And so we got close with the cameras and took the photos and then we used that, that as a teaching moment. Very distracting. Distracts you from learning. You can't see any maths in there, can you? Oh. Um, with two more years of arts integration, professional development with teachers, and we've just been shortlisted on the Innovative Teaching Funding Award, so that might help. Um, we might be able to really push things along. We will not stop the Enviro School Green Gold Kopapa that we've earned so far now. And with our new classrooms, we'll have opportunities to develop uh, all sorts of varied learning experiences without being cramped into leaky prefabs. Um, that's pretty much us, except there's this problem we're still getting. I try to make things exciting. Those are year nine kids, right? But the college and all to do ourselves are expecting a certain amount of complacency in a quite a large number of year eights and year nines, and I'm trying to get to the bottom of what that's about, whether it's just gaming, they won't, won't take part in anything, they won't take risks. That's a little challenge we've got. Um, but at Otoru we are determined to use the New Zealand curriculum's wide ability band for growth in a rich learning environment. There will be no at or below or above and the, but there will be progress and high expectations. And the kids have got high expectations of me. They um, stood over me while I wrote this book and added to it, edited it, told me when it got boring to the point when I sent it to the publishers. When all to do kids can sit still and listen to it, the publishers just said, yep. And it's just um, got a notable book a lot. Book Award 108 in the fiction, children's fiction finals, along with Joy Cowley and Gavin Bishop. So, te hei Māori ora to lifelong learning, I say. <laughs>